Good morning, everybody. Thank you for gathering. It's wonderful to see you all. And I know people are tuning in live on via Facebook. And this morning's session is the first um, of our three sessions this morning, or throughout the day, rather. And this morning's session is on the body. Last night, in conversation with Tenzin Wanga Rinpoche, talked about a sequence of body, breath, and mind. And we'll be following that sequence today, beginning with the body. My name is Michael Sheehy. I'm the Director of Scholarship at the Contemplative Sciences Center at the University of Virginia. And I'll be moderating this session this morning. We have Ruth Wolver from Vanderbilt University, who will be giving a presentation this morning. Ruth is a clinical health psychologist and associate professor of physical medicine and rehabilitation at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. And she'll begin our session with a presentation this morning. We have Lama Willa Miller as um, one of the key discussants in this session as well this morning. Lama Willa is a lineage holder in the Kagyu tradition and a scholar of Tibetan Buddhism. And Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche will be in all of our sessions, including this morning, and um, is one of the key exemplars of the Bun tradition, the living Bun tradition of Tibetan. Um, so with that, I'd like to just sort of open it up and invite you, Ruth, to sort of take the stage. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I tend to move a lot, I'm safer down here. So we'll, uh, we'll talk now about the body as a gateway to wholeness. This is a, a phrase that Richard Miller, um, well I stole from him, uh, but I really, I like the phrase because it captures the invitation that the body has for us in terms of its innate wisdom and all information that we receive really comes through our senses, really comes to us through our, um, all the different gateways of our senses. So I'm going to start us this morning, possibly, there we go. Oh, have to give disclosures so that you know if I start selling products for eMindful or something, you shouldn't buy. <laughs> Um, I'm going to start this morning kind of setting the frame from how Western medicine thinks about the physical body. And, um, you know, I'm realizing you guys are unable to see. It's okay? okay. We're fine, yeah. Okay. Um, so, you know, Western medicine really studies the body um, Human anatomy and human physiology are, are the main disciplines. And I use the um, scientific resource Wikipedia to get you these definitions. <laughs> and human anatomy is really the study of the body's structures and how the different structures relate to each other. And it was developed originally by looking at the body from the outside and imagining what was inside and studying when someone was wounded or injured, particularly soldiers. Over time, then physicians began dissecting bodies to learn about the structures. And of course, now we have uh, amazing imaging techniques and people can learn about all sorts of, not just structural, but physiological processes that happen. So the physiology is really the function and the mechanism of various parts of the body. And the key um, components of it have a lot to do with how the body maintains homeostasis, what all the different mechanisms are that help us stay in physical equilibrium, and also all the ways that the cells communicate with each other, whether it's biomolecular, chemical, whether it's the cells or cells to whole organs or systems to systems. So we're starting off from this Western uh, paradigm, if you will, 
really thinking about the physical body. And in the um, abstract, I noted that I was going to talk about three different studies, but after I timed it, I'm only going to talk about one of the three studies. I think that uh, the study that I'm going to talk about is really interesting from the perspective of setting up kind of a juxtaposition of ways that um, some of us here may think about the process. I know I, after just a couple of conversations with Rinpoche in, in preparing for this, I no longer think about it the way I thought about it uh, when we wrote the grant um, and when we researched the model. But I think it's a useful place to start. So this was a study that I did um, with a colleague at Duke, um, an ENT surgeon, who had a lot of patients with tinnitus that she was unable to help. And so she came to me as an integrative practitioner to uh, see if we could develop better ways of helping. So let me just give you a little of the background. Um, I do want to just acknowledge there are tons of people that contributed to the study, including a very strong mindfulness-based stress, uh, stress reduction teachers on the right-hand side. OK, so what we know about tinnitus, aha. Uh, by definition, tinnitus is the perception of sound in the absence of a sound source. And it's very common, 10 to 15% of adults have it. Most people habituate to it and go on functioning in a normal way. About 20% of people that have tinnitus have real severe dysfunction from it and seek help. And the most common way that they are helped through Western medicine is something called sound-based and educational therapies. And to understand how sound-based therapies work, let me also talk a little bit about the model. Okay. So the estimates are that 1.2 million people are unable to be helped from the sound-based therapies. And these are very, very rough estimates, of course. And the theory is that there's an abnormal processing in the sensory system. The limbic system, which is the seat of emotions, and the autonomic nervous system, which runs the stress response, if you will, um, contribute to this a lot. I'm going to show you how the model works. And um, folks end up with anxiety and depression and incredible interference with their day-to-day -day life. OK, so here's the theory. It's the neurophysiological model of tinnitus. It was developed by Jasterboff. And the idea is that in the central auditory system, there is a range of frequencies that at some point gets damaged. And so that range becomes unavailable to the person. So they have a hearing loss somewhere. Could be mild or partial, could be severe. And then the brain craves input. The central auditory system creates, actually, the input to match the missing hearing range. So the, the studies that support this model go back a ways and looked at people that were in chambers where they couldn't get any sound at all and generated tinnitus as a function of being unable to have the input at various levels of uh, perception. So what happens with severe tinnitus that people don't habituate to, though, is these two other elements come into play. So one has to do with our attention systems and our awareness. And you know, we are constantly, the way the brain works, we are constantly hearing tons and tons and tons of things and filtering them out actually at a subcortical level. The, so it's outside of our conscious awareness. Certain things come through the filters, right? Novel things, things that we perceive as threat um, come through, things that we need to act upon automatically. 
And this process, perhaps our neuroscientists can speak more to the process, but th this process in tinnitus uh, allows sound of tinnitus to come through with the valence of a threat. So the guy who developed the model uh, likes to use the metaphor that, you know, if we were here this morning and I brought with me a tiger and I just brought him in and I just kind of let him go in the back of the room and I said, listen, don't worry about the tiger. He hasn't eaten anybody in a while. <laughs> and then said, I have some really interesting things to say. I'd like you to listen to me now. It would be very hard to really listen to what I'm saying, right? Because you're calculating, oh, how often do tigers eat? And I, you know, <laughs> right? <laughs> You'd be constantly monitoring for that threat. So part of what's happening is something's coming out with the sound that is a threat, being perceived that way. Now, we go down to the emotional response place, and this is often an unconscious process. But that threat does a couple of things. One, it augments the autonomic nervous system's response, so the fight or flight response gets triggered. And we have sleep issues, concentration issues, um, lack of control. So people work really hard to try to do something to make the sound go away. And it's out of, out of their control. So trying harder actually makes it worse. And experience fear and anxiety. Because of the valence, people then begin, because of the threat valence, people begin to make what we call a tinnitus narrative, their story about what the sound means. So a lot of people that really come seeking help are afraid, wow, the sound wasn't there before, and now it is, and I'm wondering if I have a brain tumor. This sound is uh, a sign that I'm going crazy. This sound itself is what's gonna make me crazy. And the sounds, you know, if you go to the um, American, um, what's it called, the American Association of, of Tinnitus, or American Tinnitus Association, ATA, you can actually click on and hear what the different kinds of tinnitus sound like. It is just awful. Um, I tried to give a talk one time with that playing in the background to have everybody see what it was like. I, I couldn't do the talk very well, so I had to stop it in the middle. Mm. Incredibly, incredibly disruptive. So what happens is um, these things get paired together and the sound itself gets hooked with the emotional response and enriches or ingrains the story more, increases the stress, which increases the auditory perception. You've got these excitatory neurons that are searching for that input, and they're kind of hyper-excitatory, creating the sound, and they get sort of jacked up by the stress. So you get into this loop. So what we were interested in doing was seeing if the body, working with the body and the sound as an invitation to a kind of deeper inquiry, would help people be able to manage the tinnitus. We wondered if it would change the sound. Uh, we didn't expect it to change the sound, but what we hoped it would do was really allow people to have a greater quality of life. So our intervention was mindfulness meditation uh, based. It was an integrative intervention, so it was individually tailored for people, and it had basically these four components to it. Um, mindfulness meditation was the sort of secret sauce, if you will, in terms of our thinking about it, but we set it up with a few sessions of cognitive behavioral therapy. And what the CBT did was help the individual begin to tell their tinnitus narrative. We asked a lot of questions to kind of hear how people were making sense of the sound um, and support and kind of set up the expectations for what they could do during the mindfulness meditation, during the you know, MBSR program. They went through a full MBSR program. And then they also had health coaching to support their self-care, to support their practice and whatever things they were needing to do that they were 
learning from the process. Um, acupuncture was part of this, which is really interesting. Uh, why it's in there is interesting. So it really didn't fit with our model for the most part, but our ENT surgeon partners were really adamant that the patients that they were sending that were naive to meditation, naive to integrative medicine of any kind, really wanted to have something done to them. They were afraid of having our entire intervention be kind of self um, you know, self-regulated, if you will. So they felt it very important that we include acupuncture so that the patient, if they were used to being in that sort of recipient position, they could still sort of think they were being treated. Ooh. No. Yes. One more. And so um, <clears throat> the, the key, of course, was to try to help the person differentiate. This is very similar to how one of the ways that mindfulness is thought to help in chronic pain. Differentiate between the stimulus, or the sound in this case, and the person's story about the sound. What it means, where it came from, etc. cetera. All right, so we were pilot testing. This was an R21. You know, if you want to get funding to study, you have to do a whole bunch of studies before you can actually do the study. <laughs> so first they'll give you this much money, then they'll give you that much. Eventually they may give you a lot. This was the uh, sort of preface to a bigger study where we were pilot testing to see if the intervention itself was feasible to run on a much larger scale um, and to see what the patient acceptability was for it. Um, we had 49 patients. It was a randomized controlled trial. We randomized three to one. So there were a lot more patients in the integrative medicine component versus only the sound-based uh, education component. Those people in the integrative medicine also did get some SBE, but it was synergistic with the integrative medicine. So it was a more um, um, integrative huh, approach. Okay, so these two groups we looked at over time at three time points. We looked at them at baseline, we looked at them at the end of a six-month treatment period, and then we looked at them three months later to see what was maintained as a function of the, the treatment. And we used growth curve modeling. It was basically a way to look at the slope of change in um, our various um, outcome measures. On average, the patients were 56. 41% were female, 88% were Caucasian. So I'm just going to show you a couple of, of outcomes um, just to sort of get us thinking about it. So our primary measure, in addition to feasibility, was the, tan han the tinnitus handicap inventory. And this, the THI, really gives you a measure of the degree to which the person is suffering and the tinnitus is interfering with their life. So there is not a strong correlation between the intensity of the sound, the, lo the loudness of the sound, the pitch, and suffering. Those things are not correlated. And so what we really wanted to look at was from a quality of life perspective, what uh, degree did the tinnitus play in interfering with their life? And what we found is that we got this nice cross, go back. <laughs> um, yeah, so we spend all this money and years looking for a little cross in line, so we were very happy <laughs> to find that. In essence, the experimental group, the integrative treatment group, had a steeper slope, so they improved faster over the six months, and then they continued to improve between the end of the treatment and three months later when we did a, a follow-up. If we look at the coping measures, we were also interested in how did people internalize what they were doing to manage the symptoms. And um, the COPE is a, a paper and pencil questionnaire that basically gives you an idea of what strategies people are using. And uh, three of these are considered healthy coping. So positive reframing that people were able to, in the experimental group, were able to make a different perspective, take a different perspective in understanding what was going on. 
Um, emotional support, the degree to which they felt, you know, supported by loved ones and their community, including their healthcare community. Um, instrumental support, so some kind of tangible support, somebody to give you a ride somewhere. You have to, of course, be able to ask for help, um, as well as recognize the help that's there in instrumental support. And then religion, which can be a positive or a negative coping strategy, depending on, on how it's used. So let me just tell you two stories of uh, patients, just so you can get a flavor. Um, one participant, this particular person, was a 52-year-old single white female. She was a full-time nurse, and she was so desperate for help, she drove four hours one way every week <laughs> to get to, to access the treatment for this study. When she started, she was at the highest level which can, uh, of the THI, of the tinnitus handicap inventory, and she had had a really severe, um, um, she had severe stress related to her job, and she also had family stress. She also had a history of trauma that played in here, of course. And at baseline, in her first cognitive behavioral therapy session, she said when her, that her tinnitus was at a 9.5, and that when it reaches 10, I'm going to get a shotgun. So pretty desperate. By the end of the six months, she was down to grade one, just slight interference from the tinnitus. This incredibly stressful work crisis had been reframed. She had now a new perspective that it was just weird. <laughs> she was able to actually take a significant professional step, leave the stressful job, and find a very useful new uh, position for herself. And she attended everything, despite living four hours from, from the, um, the treatments. At three months follow-up, she said that the, the coaching and the MBSR were really instrumental to helping her find her power, feel empowered. And um, she said, the study was life-changing for me. I can't tell you how much things have improved. My life is completely different now. Let me give you one more example. This is a 38-year-old white female, married, full-time homemaker, uh, started at a severe category at THI of 72, and again, reported that she wished that the end was in sight. So these folks were pretty desperate when they came in. By the end of the treatment, she was able to recognize negative thoughts and challenge them. She was able to more clearly see her own reactivity to things and allow things, let things go more easily. And she reported feeling more balanced and better able to be proactive about her health and prioritize her self-care as a high priority. And uh, she began calling herself Grace and recognized that she needed to say no to a lot of things in order to be Grace. So this is the last participant I want to tell you. Oh, I'm sorry. Three months after that, she was still at a low level. Her quote, oh, she became like our mindfulness champion. Her, she was so excited, and she said, you know, the study has helped so much. Coaching was awesome, and mindfulness is amazing. I'm telling everybody I meet about mindfulness. So it was really, yeah, it was really endearing. OK, the last participant I want to mention, if I can find him. There we go. This is a 63-year-old white married female was also at severe in terms of the interference um, from tinnitus, and it dropped to a mild um, in the, at the end of the six months. Three months later, it had stayed at mild, and she had really used the mindfulness and the coaching to support her in relationships and to support her relationship with work, and in both of those scenarios, a lot of work around setting boundaries. She uh, did a lot of work also on focusing what she could and could not control and not the tiger in the back of the room. And she said, and I think this is really sweet because it sort of captures what we were imagining for, hoping for. Um, she said, my tinnitus still bothers me at times and it hasn't gone away, but my relationship to it has changed. I can feel the difference in my mind and my soul. Can say it any better than that. Thank you.
Thank you, Ruth. That's fa fabulous. I love these stories of intervention and, yeah. and healing. Um, so I'm going to open it up now for sort of broader conversation about Ruth's content, but, but really about the body. And um, Lama Willa, uh, you know, uh, maybe we can begin by just talking about what we mean by the body, and, and the body in the big sense, um, dimensions of body or embodiment, um, and sort of definitions and boundaries of the body. notion um, had a had a science mother um, that the body is instrumental and that the body is as good as it conform performs um, a kind of um, an instrumental model of the body the body is what it does. It's important because what, of what it does and not so much of what it is. Hmm. Um, and I don't think that message came in particular from my family, but more from the culture that I was growing up in. And it wasn't really until I met Tibetan Buddhism, yogic Buddhism, that my perspective on the body shifted. And and what I encountered there, and have since, since studied both academically and through practice, is that the body is a place of pilgrimage. Hmm. And, and what I mean by that is in the practice of yogic Buddhism, like the kind of practices done here at Lake Mincha um, and, and elsewhere, um, the encouragement of the practitioner is to go, is to explore layers of embodiment, layers of embodiment. And, and one of the first things I encountered in starting to explore those layers is, is something that I'm now calling the difference between a conceptual body and an experiential body that, um, and I think many of us are carrying around concepts, ideas about what the body is and, and what the body does. Those ideas could be body image, um, my body is heavy, my body is light, my body is ugly, my body is beautiful. Um, we have a lot of judgments about the body and all of those are conceptual. But what I encountered in, in Buddhist practice is that there's also this experiential body. And that has very little to do with the conceptual body. We might have to kind of get through the conceptual veil. But on the other side of that is this body that is feeling right now. It is feeling. It is breathing. It is sensing, it is vivid, it is wakeful, and it's in the present moment. It doesn't have any ideas about what it is. It is. This is. <laughs> this is. This sensory field. So, so I think in, and, and in, in the yogic model, actually the pilgrimage is this pilgrimage through that field it's described, we've already heard it described a bit last night by um, Rinpoche as a layered body. There's the physical, which here we're calling the body. There's the energetic, which has the name in, in Tibetan Buddhism or in, um, in Tibetan medicine too, as the subtle body, this energetic layer 
And then there's this layer of the mind, awareness, that is permeating all of that, that, that in the context of this conference we might say is the mind layer, right? So the body layer, the breath layer, or the energy layer, and the, and the mind layer. And there's actually one more layer in the practice of, of yogic Buddhism, and that is the inseparability of those, of those three in terms of like a schema of the kayas. Kaya means body, like the nirmana kaya, samboga kaya, dharma kaya. It would be swabhavaka kaya, right? This notion that, that the physical, the energetic, and the um, awareness are completely fused and inseparable on one level. So those are just a few thoughts. Um, I have more thoughts, but we're going to have a conversation. So <laughs> <start with> that. <laughs> Rubiche, please. Um, any thoughts particularly on what Ruth or, yeah. or Lama Willa have said? Uh, you hear me? Okay, good. <laughs> um, so maybe I will just continue what uh, Lama Miller was mentioning. That uh, the notion of body, it's uh, very big, then very limiting to this physical body. Um, so, for example, mentioning like a uh, conceptual body, or mentioning even the kar karmic body, or mentioning the uh, rainbow body or body of light, like in the Dzogchen tradition. So in the tantric tradition, illusory body, mm -hmm. then in Tibetan medical, more like the sense of energetic body. So I think mm -hmm. some sense body for us, it means a lot different thing. So, when we work with the body, uh, but we also don't work with only one aspect of the body. I think mm -hmm. I cannot hear everything what you're saying. I want to talk to you later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what I understand, like this, in the noise, the sound hearing yeah. part, is with the mindful practice, there's a significant reduction, right? That, that the noise doesn't change, but there's a reduction in the distress. Res resp response. And, and okay. Right. Yeah. So. I mean, for example, like that. So uh, probably eventually the noise will also change <laughs> because mm. the noise is, in some sense, is a very subjective, subjective creation. So like in the Dzogchen practices, there is mm -hmm. a whole thing called, maybe we'll talk later, yeah. it's called practice of sound. So people, uh, people actually close their air for like a week long, two week long, in order to produce the noise. Yeah. So it's, it's a part of the practice. Mm. So they produce this noise in order to work with the noise. Mm -hmm. Because you, at some point, it, to realize these, are no, these noises are just a, just a creation of that yourself. Mm -hmm. So that until you recognize that, you have to work with the noise. Even you don't have a noise, you have to create one by mm -hmm. keeping close. So in some sense, what I'm saying here is that, in a sense, deep in sense, our conscious body, or body of light, or, um, body of awareness, affects the rest of it, mm -hmm. the, all the experiences of our life. So in the end, physical body matters, but also the body of awareness matters more, mm -hmm. right? So I think uh, um, I've personally been very interested. I've been, you know, I started California, a three-year program called Body of Light. Mm -hmm. So in some, somehow, my interest in that is, so somehow I believe, I feel that um, everything what happened in our body or happening in our body, our relationship, our body is so disconnected. So, so much lack of connection there. Uh, mm. I think that's the consequences what we are suffering a lot in our body. And uh, if, if we are able to be more aware of not this body, but body, what we call eternal body, body of awareness, mm -hmm. or body of light, something beyond this body, mm -hmm. beyond physical body. If you are more conscious of yourself or your another higher body, which is beyond this physical body, 
that awareness will have so much influences on this physical body and and around physical environment around you. Mm -hmm. So I think um, so I think this is all very interesting, and I'm looking forward to continuously have conversation. Yeah. Yes. So there's a lot there. Um, and I'd like to circle back, Rinpoche, to what you ended on, on the sense of an, an extended body and, and the environment around the body. But maybe we can circle back around to that. I'd like also to link some of what Woodruff said, particularly this notion of story and storytelling um, and the somatosensory body. And with your study with, um, in particular, and some of the things that Rinpoche and Lama Willa said about, um, and particularly last night, the, the sense of identity emerging in association with the body. Yeah. So um, could we talk about, Ruth, do you have anything to say in particular about um, the processes of identification or self-making, selving, yeah. if, yeah. if you will? Um, with the body and, and how they related to, to some of the work that you've done? Yeah, let me f first lay one sort of foundational um, piece here, which just has to do with my experience in the, in the conference. So, you know, to, when we wrote the grant and when we conceptualized the treatment and so on and so forth, you know, I was using this neurophysiological model which is very physical body, right? The brain is creating the sound, right? <laughs> the, there's damage here, you know, maybe you worked with a jackhammer, or you went to too many rock concerts or whatever, you know, <laughs> and patients really struggle with what did I do to create this thing? But the, the creation, what did I do to damage my central auditory system? But the, it's seen that the brain is what's creating it. So in our first discussion to prepare for this, you know, Rinpoche says, well, no, the self creates it. I'm like, huh. <laughs> it's just so profound, right? And I think mm -hmm. part of where, um, I feel like in our intervention, we kind of had the, you know, the toe of the elephant, right? Because we were helping people work with their stories, how they interpreted the sound, um, their, their tinnitus self, their, you know, you were talking about identity, right? They identified around the sound and spent an enormous amount of their attention on what it is, what I can't do because of it, all the difficulties I have because of it. Um, so I, f I feel like we were very helpful to people in beginning to put the possibility out that there was a difference in the sound and the self. Mm -hmm. um, and it's fascinating to me to think about the, you know, the self sort of creating the sound. Of course, not consciously and no blame there and all that, but um, it's just, a, it's fascinating. So yeah. there's a kind of locus here called body and there's sound and self and they're, they're happening within this locus, this kind of matrix of embodiment, right? And when I hear you talk about that and, and the sort of narratives around the construction of, of the bodily self, I also think about your conceptual body. Do you, do you hear things in uh, what Ruth presented that resonate with your sense of conceptual body? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the idea that you, that you were doing an intervention that worked with the story, mm -hmm. and that's really uh, so, so much what is a part of moving from conceptual body to experiential body because you have to let go of this, of this whatever it is that we're thinking about what we're feeling, like you, you were describing. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And Rinpoche, last night you, you mentioned this word, which we didn't, or this phrase, we didn't have a chance to unpack, but you used the word pain body. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, um, uh, maybe I wanted to say a little bit what yeah, Ruth was please. saying. So in our everyday life, if you think about our everyday life, there is a sound of dissatisfaction mm. that we don't call it dysfunctioning personality, but some people have a lot, some people less, but all the time inside, something is wrong, something is wrong, that person is wrong, I am wrong, this went wrong like that. Mm. So that is also in some, some sense 
it's, it's, I mean, people who live, oh, I'm alone, I'm lonely, nobody loves me, nobody likes me, mm. they exclude me. These are sounds, right? These are sounds. Mm. And they are activating unconsciously all the time, and they do definitely have some consequences. But what, what we call, like, these are like an inner pain speech. Mm. So this pain speech, actually, which is a sound, mm. it's coming from pain identity, which is some sense of identity. conceptual identity or, uh, or what I prefer is a more like a pain identity because it's mm. a, uh, some sense of uh, identifying with one's weakness and condition rather than one's possibility and potentiality. Mm -hmm. So uh, I am not good. You carry that thought for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And how you are going to do any good if you are not good? <laughs> yeah. So, and you're not going to hear nice things either. You will hear dissatisfaction sounds in the head all the time, day and night. Mm -hmm. So these, these are voices which is clearly coming up from that pain identity, which is what we think about as a body. Like when we talked yesterday as a sequence. Yeah. There is a sequence. I think that's also very important to be a little bit aware of, you know? So this reminds me of um, talk therapy. And um, so talk therapy, as I understand it, please, please correct me, is one of the two major kind of diagnostic treatments for depression along with medication and so forth. And recently I was um, translating some Tibetan um, texts that are kind of uh, therapeutic texts about how to um, overcome depression. And at one point in the Tibetan text, this is like um, 12th century text, it says, okay, once you've done this sort of practice, then sit and think about your social relationships and how positive they are. Your relationship to your teacher, your relationship to your friends and family. And I just paused. And I thought that that's so fantastic. Mm -hmm. So there's, as I hear Rinpoche talking, a kind of voice, right, that, that comes from the pain identity and the pain <laughs> voice. But then there's also the social construction of the body, right, that emerges, and the cultural construction of the body that emerges from those voices. So I just wanted to sort of open that up to the boundaries of the body being social and cultural, mm -hmm. if they're emergent from these voices. Well, I think, you know, from a very Western perspective, there's a lot about attentional bias, they call it. So mm. what it is that you orient to, you know, what subcortical messages are allowed to come through, whether it's a sound or um, a thought. So, you know, if you're really depressed, we know that people that are depressed attend to the problem, you know, are focused on what's wrong and you have to actually train them to attend to the goodness in relationships because that's not what's automatically coming through. And there's this whole you know, learning process, if you will, where we create our filters about what it is we attend to and what we don't attend to, right? And so that's part of, I, I think it's part of the meditation process, but I also, I mean, that's talk therapy. When you, when you were saying, you know, we don't, we don't say there's anything wrong if you only speak from the pain body or whatever. I was thinking, yeah, I'm a psychologist. We do. We say something's wrong if that's all <laughs> we do. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> I, I wondered when you were presenting if you had used any measures around... Um, your, the subjects in the studies relationship not just with the sound that they were hearing but with their body as a whole mm. whether you asked them any questions about that or if that was part of the measure mm. yeah it was not it would be fascinating I mean we got little glimpses from the sort of debriefing interviews where we asked them about their experiences but we didn't measure it it would be very interesting mm. Because one of the, I think one of the interesting interventions that exists in this tradition for the pain body, actually, and the conceptual body, is are these practices of see of valuing the body mm -hmm. as a mandala, or as a, sometimes it's a mandala, sometimes it's a deity, 
but this idea that the body is inherently sacred and has a kind of natural dignity. And I don't know that we have those models so much in the West, but it, it makes me wonder, like how much is our, just our general image of the body as just this lump of flesh influencing how we relate to illness, I guess. Mm. Rinpoche, do you have any insight into that, having done so much practice <laughs> in your life? No, I totally agree with you. I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, so yeah. we, ha we have practices, right? Yeah, 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 we have practices, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I... I <laughs> 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 so you, you use mindfulness-based intervention, yeah. right? And you had some success. But there's so many other practices, right, within these traditions for rescripting narratives, looping right. narratives around the body. And so mm. Well, and I maybe so. You ask me again one more time. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, like when we do visualization yeah. practice, uh -huh. right, Chiram, yeah. yeah. we are seeing our own body mm. as this divine abode, mm. and then we travel inside sure. and we see the la lamo inside sure. the body, mm. sure. and that changes our relationship, I think, yeah. with this notion of, that we have in the West, that our body's just a lump of flesh. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. it's, and sometimes even worse, that it's just a walking corpse or there's nothing useful sure. about it. Yeah. yeah, I think absolutely, you know, like uh, for us, like in tantric tradition, so basically every body is like, a, they say, a, a palace of divine. And that means every channel, every chakra, every cell, every organ, the, every senses, every sense consciousness, is every single thing in the body, it's mm -hmm. whole mandala. And that everything represented by different deities, mm -hmm. sacred syllables, sacred sounds, sacred energies, sacred goddesses. So in some sense, it's like a, it's a, it's a walking sacred temple. Mm -hmm. You know, so you when you have a, in our life, generally, we go somewhere like miles to go, go to the church, temple, sacred mountains. But this is just portable mm -hmm. <laughs> temple walking around you all the time. And you have any given mo minute, you have access to it. And that meditation is, in some sense, about being aware of those sacredness in our body, right? Yeah. So that uh, clearly is very different than looking at bodies like a sin uh -huh. or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So. We had well, I was just going to say, I think for a lot of people, um, it, like in the trial, the cultivation of loving kindness mm -hmm. towards self was really important in this because they come in thinking their body has let them down. Their body is not serving them. They're furious at their body. And there's this mm -hmm. whole, you know, thing to work through about, um, you know, bad body, <laughs> right? Yeah. Last night, Rinpoche, you described something, a way of dealing with our difficult emotions um, that you said, I think you said a warm, luminous... Spacious, luminous, warm hug. Oh, <laughs> so beautiful. <laughs> and I was thinking, like, what... Did you have something like that, like a way for people to give a spacious, luminous, warm hug to those feelings in the study mm. or not? We didn't um. think about it like that. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking, that would be like the best grant ever. It would uh. only take one page. We're going to give one of these to everybody. <laughs> Spacious, luminous, warm hug. Right. Yeah. Didn't make the NIH language. Right. Yeah. Um, I do think there was probably something healing about, um, I mean, the, the the clinical team is an amazing, generous um, group of people. And I think something about being present um, with them and uh, them sort of helping to hold the container so people could give that hug to themselves, mm. I think is maybe what was happening. Mm. I can't prove maybe, that. But. Maybe I will just say a little bit about spacious, luminous, warm hug, otherwise sounds like a nice, but also for some people it might sound strange. Um, so when I use this term, of course I use this term on a very, based on a very basic principles, backgrounds of the teaching knowledge tradition, mm -hmm. not just the idea. So many times when we talk about the truth, the body, the core, 
we think about everything is empty, which is true. Mm -hmm. Everything is empty. There's nothing, 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 nothing. So you're not there. Your eyes not there. People are not there. Your friends, families are not there. Somehow, this idea of nothing is there. It's true, but repeating that so often, to people who don't feel to begin with there's anything, mm -hmm. they put them more depressed, more hopeless. Mm -hmm. So it sounds not very encouraging when people are in down already, mm -hmm. saying you're you're no one. <laughs> <laughs> but so I think the idea of a spacious, luminous, warm hug is spacious word has something to do with the body, again, to relating with the body. The idea of spacious means you are not bounded like this body, physical body is bounded. So you are not this bounded body, mm -hmm. you are spacious body, you are eternal body. We say jurva may be ku. You are eternal body, uh, like a dharmakaya. So that is who you are, space, open. And if you are aware of that, that's called luminous. Lum luminous luminosity is basically it's awareness. We refer to awareness. Mm -hmm. you know, we, this is luminous light, but this is not awareness as my luminous mind, which is awareness. So luminous, luminosity, luminous means aware of that unbounded body rather than stuck in bounded body. So, so that's the second word. Third word is the warmth. Warmth is sometimes it's called bliss. Uh, even in a tantric practice, the highest, deepest sense of warmth is created or generated when the subtle wind and subtle awareness, when they unite, the bliss is created. Mm -hmm. And the bliss is the deepest processor of uh, obscurations. Mm. So uh, warmth in this case is when you are when you are being that boundless body, when you are connected and aware of that boundless body, which is luminous, you f you have that warmth, in which you give to your pure bounded body who is sick. Yeah, and then that's how we give. We give spacious, luminous, mm. warm hug to my knee. Yeah, mm. this is a manifested body which is suffering, but I have my unbounded body which has a lot of light, a lot of warmth, which are, all, all this warmth are what I call is a medicine, so I'm just giving to my knee. And we have done some researches, mm -hmm. I mean, these are, you know, like, like more than 30% of pain, physical pain re re reduce, re reduction, and also people sometimes stop taking medicine or needing medicine, less medicine, or again, it's many cases where pain did not go, but they have mm -hmm. better relationship with the pain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question for, for Rinpoche, um, if I can articulate it. So to me, part of the challenge is what is unconscious, you know, what's mm. outside of our awareness. Um, so the tinnitus patients that were suffering, for example, you know, they didn't make a decision to suffer, sure. right? Um, and they didn't try to create it or what have you. Um, how do I articulate? I'm, I'm curious, uh, when you move to spacious awareness, of course you're bigger than consciousness, but um, like what's the, what's the, I'm curious what the connection or how, what the passage is from, you know, like the part where you give the knee the hug, you know, that making the conscious. Does anybody know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, I think I know what you're okay. trying to say. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So, for example, the knee, uh, severe knee pain or, or the noise, the hearing. So when you have that, of course, you are disturbed by that. You know, mm -hmm. you are constantly, uh, your attention, as you're talking, your attention is always on the pain rather than s solution, rather than maybe there might be some purpose for this pain, rather than who is feeling the pain, rather than may they, maybe there's no one is feeling the pain. This is just an experience happening in the body. There's no kind of analysis like that or trying to be aware of it. It's just, you are bad. I, I hate the pain, I hate the pain, I hate the pain. Some point you forget, you hate the pain or you hate the knee. I hate the knee, uh -huh. I hate the knee, I hate the pain, I hate the knee. So you hate, it's like you develop this hate relationship yeah. 
to your own body. Right. And uh, so what in our practice is what we're trying to do is first, you cannot have, you cannot give a spacious, luminous, warm hug because you're not spacious, neither luminous, n nor do you have any warmth, you have a hate. <laughs> uh -huh. That's what you're giving to the pain. Your knee, poor knee is suffering because you're giving hate, mm -hmm. no warmth. Mm -hmm. So first thing is to control the hate or control that constant negative relationship to, to your pain. Yeah. So that's, that's what we do is we say, we're trying to introduce called three precious pills. This is the medicine we give them. But it's not a pill. Yeah. <laughs> we say stillness in your body, silence in your speech, spaciousness in your mind. We call it white, red, blue pill. Body, speech, mm. and mind, three precious pills. So any time when you are suffering the pain, any time you are looking pain as something wrong, when you are mad, at, angry at your pain, you're criticizing your pain, we say, take those pills. So just, mm -hmm. you be aware of that, then I'm just trying to bring my full attention to whole body as a whole body, not only my knee. I'm not only knee, I have a whole body. There's a lot of places I don't have a pain, so I, my awareness in the whole body and, and my awareness not in the movement in the body, but my awareness in the stillness of the body. That's more who I am, not the movement. Movement is happening in that stillness. And the pain is just a small manifestation of that movement, which is nothing. Stillness. You go deep, 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 deep in the stillness to the point you have a more relationship with your whole body, much better mm -hmm. than only one pain. So when you change their relationship, and then that point, what we say, now trying to be aware of inner, inner stillness, not only awareness of the body, not only the awareness of the stillness in the body, but awareness of your being, who you are, which is the conscious body, mm -hmm. the luminous body, the body of light. Then you, then you go into this stillness in a sense of that sense of stillness, and then from there, now you have spacious awareness. You have over now you can give spacious, luminous, warm hug. Mm. So then you come back. Now I have a different body. I have a different awareness. I have a different warmth in me. Now I'm going to give you the medicine. Now I'm doctor. Mm. So then you come back to the knee. That's what we're trying to do. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. So, so much is about changing your relationship with yeah. your body. Back to this re-scripting the narrative. Changing your relationship to the knee by changing your relationship to yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this word creeps in again, yeah. the self mm -hmm. and the identity, right? Yeah, somebody so, there. Do we have time for others? Yeah, we have questions coming up in a minute. Um, would you like to take questions? Did you want to say anything else? Yeah, you want to say? Um, oh, just one thing that was sort of knitting together as you were speaking, Rinpoche, was the, the and, and also Ruth, um, this idea that um, Michael brought up about the social body and that something happens when we're in pain when it, it's it almost worse than the pain itself which is isolation mm. from other people because you have the pain, but you feel like the person sitting right next to you doesn't know what mm -hmm. you are feeling. And, and there are also practices in, mm. in the Buddhist tradition to address that social isolation that we feel when we're in pain, like the practice of Tonglen, which immediately reaches out to the pain of others and connects to it and then brings it back in relationship to our own pain. So I was also just thinking about and wondering if one of the benefits of a study, like the one that Ruth did, that might be even unrecognized, is the collegiality between the tinnitus subjects who finally are meeting people, other people who have tinnitus. My mm -hmm. husband has tinnitus, so I'm somewhat aware of that uh, isolation factor. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and just wondering like, how much of that, how much of, of that might be a part of what helped them. 
Yeah, it's a great question. They actually didn't meet other people with tinnitus because in the MBSR program was a full MBSR program. Okay. So if another person happened to be in that program, maybe they did, but okay. the, mm. most of them, they were put in, we ran like four cycles of MBSR four times a year, so they ended up in all different. So there was but no it, anyway, but yes from people, but maybe not people with tinnitus. So there was no tinnitus like cohort. And it would be interesting right. if you did a similar study to have that. Right? Yeah. Because then there's sort of right. shared, yeah. Yeah, shared experiences experience. and, and yeah. the kind of impact that might yeah. arise from that. So relational body, social body, right? Um, so we have about 10 or 15 minutes. Let's open it up. In, in the way back, uh, the woman in the purple shirt, yeah. <laughs> There's also um, something to do with fragmentation within self. Um, in dance studies, we talk about when we're in pain, a sense of objectifying the part. So if my knee is hurting or if I have a cold, this sense of betrayal, like my body is doing this to me, and then there's a sense of separation between self and body versus when we feel good within our bodies, like this morning in our meditation, this sense of I am um, feeling well-being and I am feeling alive and available. So is there a sense of um, kind of internal fragmentation and a move to reunification from conceptual to experiential self? Just a, a clarification from my own and, and hopefully the others. In both of those examples you gave, there's an identification with the body mm -hmm. and, the different, well, and that there are different types of identification? Is yeah, that a, maybe a sense of, um, I'm kind of just working this out out loud, but maybe a sense of um, separation, maybe not so much identification. Myself is the thing that is resisting the pain, but the part is, is, um, is the object almost. Yeah, I, I just, I find that fascinating, the idea that we are the subject and the body is the object, right? And how true is that? How true is that? Um, certainly in Buddhist practice, in meditation practice, some of the aim is, is toward a gradual somatic unification between body and mind. And I don't know how much we really have methods to do that in the West. I mean, I think that comes up naturally, like if you're a dancer. Right when you're dancing, you feel totally at one with body and mind until the pain, right? Because I'm a dancer too, so I totally respect what you're talking about. Um, but yeah, yeah, like uh, the unification as being a kind of a, a a goal and being willing to be unified with your pain. I guess. Do you have pain? Everyone has pain. <laughs> <laughs> of calling it the knee, the, you know, as it, that it kind of creates a subtle sense of separation uh -huh. rather than um, my part of myself. Um. Yeah, in the cognitive sciences, they have this model um, that they work with in experimentation as um, body as subject or body as object. And, you know, the famous kind of phantom limb syndrome mm -hmm. and so forth and full body illusions experiments where you can actually sort of displace yourself or disassociate from your body. And so sense of disembodiment, even though your sense of self may be located in a body. Um, so there's also that. There's other ways that we relate with the self in the body that aren't necessarily located centrally within the body, right? So there was a person in the, in the back corner. You had your hand up? Yes. Uh, I was wondering if you, you could uh, speak to the, how you see the relationship between the word placebo in the West and, and mindfulness <laughs> and, and the nature of mind. Placebo and mindfulness. <laughs> <laughs> How does, you threw I mean, the nature of mind? Okay, it. I'll start it very concretely. <laughs> placebo effect. So, you know, so the term placebo comes out of the biomedical model where an inert substance, a pill, that didn't have the particular magic 
ingredient that was going to be tested or you know to heal whatever the issue is and um, you know obviously it's a very narrow um, conceptualization because um, there's actually even when you take the placebo you're doing a lot of things and you're gathering you're cultivating your belief in healing you have a social interaction where you know through the study or where you get the medicine uh, you have expectations associated with what's going to happen um, so there's a lot of contextual factors I think that biomedicine historically hasn't given credence to um, in terms of meditation you know to me, meditation, well, in a lot of integrative medicine, is actually about really leveraging all these contextual factors that Western medicine has kind of said are noise. We don't want to pay attention to them. And um, to me, they're, you know, the active magic ingredient. Thank you. Did you have a follow-up question? Or? Yeah, I mean, I, I just thought it was interesting in the beginning of the yeah. study. Mm. So the idea of having something done to you yeah. seems like this access yeah. to sort of a, you know, a higher you know, nature of mind or mindfulness, or in, in the results that were sort of affected, the, the patients had actually started to do mindfulness and sort of like creating their own placebo effect. Yeah, I, I think that is. I think that is part of what happened. And you know, the the explanation you gave about you can't give it a a luminous, spacious, warm hug because you don't have one, um, huh. I think is really, I think maybe part of this, right? That you have to kind of get in touch with it in order to do it. Like I, I go back to the metaphor with the tiger, you know? You can't just say, don't worry about the tiger. I mean, you could say it, but it doesn't help, right? You have to know that you can play with the tiger and that you've got other people to help you manage the tiger. And, you know, I mean, it seems like there's a lot that you have to innately learn or know before you're going to be okay hanging out with the tiger. Or hugging the tiger. Or hugging the tiger. <laughs> <laughs> Andy? Yeah, please. Thanks. Uh, Ruth, this is for you, but anyone else who wants to comment. Um, I was listening to this and, you know, nodding my head and trying to measure myself versus an NIH panel. So imagine if, and you didn't have all that weird stuff behind them. You know, you did have a rinpoche, but you didn't have weird stuff behind them. And, you know, what's their listening? Because he said about the warm hug, but he said it in a really approachable way. It wasn't mm. like, oh, that's just weird. No, he said, I know that may sound weird, but... Is the culture there listening enough to appreciate a panel like this? Let me get in touch with my warm, luminous part before I answer. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a great question. I think there are, are little openings. Um, I do think you have to package things in a way that they can be heard, you know, unfortunately. I mean, I was telling Will at breakfast that after talking to you several times, like I feel like I'm now talking about, you know, a bunch of stuff that's not true, like all the stuff we studied, right? <laughs> because it's bigger, you know? But I don't think that would go over well with a study section. <laughs> like, at least better than maybe 10 years ago? Oh, absolutely, okay. yeah, yeah. For sure. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Uh, hello. Um, yes, uh, yes, please, miss. Yeah. Hello, I have a brief comment. Uh, I'm a 11-year uh, practitioner with Rinpoche, and about year uh, four or five, when I was studying, had been studying, I developed tinnitus. This is quite interesting for us, the two of us <laughs> looking at this. <laughs> and I came here, I would, uh, put myself in the grade two category. Um, I was working at UVA at the time in the School of Medicine, and since I've retired, that's improved quite a bit. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, we we had a beautiful practice. 
when I came here, I had no expectation. The, the uh, tenthness was controllable and I wasn't upset about it. After the practice, uh, Rinpoche often asks, how was the practice? And I raised my hand and I explained I had developed tenthness and it was gone. So I went from a level two to zero, mm -hmm. zero, okay. Uh, since then, I, my kind of story that I deal with is when I hear the tintiness, it sounds like beautiful music. Mm -hmm. It's very silvery, has kind of a silver mm -hmm. color to it. And I say, oh, there it is again. When mm -hmm. I come back here, it's gone. Do you want to talk to me about it at lunch? I'll go on. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Other questions? Now on, maybe less. So my question is for the root. <clears throat> it's not a kind of very small question. Mm -hmm. So I attend this kind of conference in the past and for the clinical researchers and for the scientists, Many people, they use uh, mindfulness meditation. So why you guys are not using mindfulness training and mindfulness exercise? The reason why I'm telling you is because, you know, in the past I met few people, they taught like meditation, then they use meditation. Of course, you know, uh, it's kind of a culture of East, of you know, you know, South Asian, and then also Buddhist and Burmese Buddhism. So, you know, it, uh, for, for the, uh, uh, especially this kind of uh, clinical researchers and then also for the scientists, uh, what I see is if we use, instead of mindfulness meditation, if we use mindfulness training and mindfulness exercise, it would be more comfortable for the other people. There are, you know, uh, uh, Dalai Lama sort of telling us like one billion, one billion uh, human being is ETS. So mm -hmm. for them, and then also there are different kinds of religious people so I think, you know, in the, in, the, in, the, in the sense of, you know, for scientists and the religious people, it's okay for the scientists and clinical research, I think it's better to use this. That's my suggestion, yes. small suggestion. Yes. Uh, I don't know, maybe my audience, I don't know. No, I th well, I would Thank agree you. with you. Um, in fact, when I started doing training in corporate America, we decided not to use the word meditation at all. We just used the word mindfulness practice. And for the same reason, it makes a lot of sense. But I've found enough people in, well, I mean, clearly here is a different audience. But I think it's a, I think it's a really wise point. Wonderful. So we're at our designated time. Oh, we have 15 more. Feel um, the spaciousness? Right? Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thank you. so we started maybe 15 minutes earlier. So... Um, <laughs> Yeah, why don't we take some more questions then? This gentleman with the t-shirt here. So um, I'm a psychologist practitioner, um, I guess teaching some very um, introductory meditation practices. And uh, one of the things that seems like a commonality is um, in terms of the mechanism of change is changing one's relationship to discomfort, whether it be physical pain or emotional pain or cognitive pain. Um, recognizing it, um, accepting it, just shifting that relationship. And it seems like that is um, like a really important and effective mechanism, but it still seems like it's predicated on self, like I'm changing my relationship to pain. Um, and you started to talk about something when you mentioned the I or the self. So I'm thinking about like the way current um, packages of interventions with mindfulness and everything are developed for a general audience from a, a therapy perspective and wondering how or what the next steps might be in terms of generalizing our thinking about self and a sense of I or a lack of I or um, mm. I guess I don't have a great question for him but just kind of I was curious mm -hmm. where the thinking is around this or what you think the next steps might be. So uh, interventions for the self, a sense of self, and what kind of sort of mindfulness-based interventions there might be to work with identification processes? Is that your question? Um, I guess I don't know what my question is. But, um, <laughs> sure. Because, so I think of with MBSR, uh, or Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction, a general packaged eight-week meditation training course, 
Um, very often people say, well, what's next? What can I do next? And so much of it seems like it's shifting relationship to discomfort so that people can um, more adaptively deal with stress. But it seems like it's still very much predicated on the sense of I. So I don't know if there's like an MBS. No, to repeat that question one time for the audience. Sure. So um, I'm paraphrased, and if I understand correctly, did your questions um, about what do you do, um, what practices can be employed and cultivated for understanding one's relationship to pain and particularly identification processes with pain that, that give a sense of, of self and self-identity. So, Rinpoche? I hope I understand the question, so, but maybe I will, yeah, you please. know. So, so generally, <clears throat> I think in the West, uh, you know, uh, like mindful practice becoming a very, in a way, enough secular, even though maybe still can be more like an online saying. But I think all of them has something to do with a very strong Western culture in it, mm -hmm. like a trademark yeah. training program. Whose who's mindful program is it? <laughs> Name of the person they are <laughs> attached to it. And all of those things are not right. You know, mm -hmm. so I think some sense there's a still very strong sense of I is attached to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think in some sense, like in teaching in the Buddhism, that's the whole, uh, whole idea is to go beyond it. Mm -hmm. So even though all the practices are working and everything's working, somehow in the, all, in the end, it's about going beyond the I. Yeah. Body is it's just one manifestation, but the harder part is there. The sense of I, which, which can so tricky, it can, it, it's easy to recognize the bad stuff, but it can hide behind the good stuff. Yeah, it's very tricky. Yeah, so it's I think <laughs> that that's the really like a, uh, as a practitioner, as a Buddhist practitioner, that is I think a very important question, and you always wanted to make sure that no matter what technique you are doing, what you are doing, don't get trapped in that. But then as a business model. And that <laughs> in the Western world, then it's a little different. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of very hard to separate those things. So yeah. as a follow-up mm -hmm. question, and, and I'd like to hear from you, Lama Willa, but just to sort of take some of what's been said, uh, one of the questions I've had as we've been thinking through these um, different themes is what would it be like to um, have a body without the self-identification process? In other words, is the self always located in the body? And we have sort of, even in the dream, right, the dream self, um, a sense of your body and what you're doing. So. I was going to enter into a little conversation with Rinpoche that takes up with what you're saying um, about, yes, but also there is a cost to ignoring the relative self in favor of the ultimate self. And, and certainly in, in spiritual circles, I mean, I don't know, you guys, many of you are in spiritual circles, in religious circles, in Buddhist circles, so this might ring true for you or it might not. But if there is a possibility to be like, I'm gonna just go for selflessness, I'm gonna get rid of this thing. I don't want this thing, it is my problem. Um, but in doing so, we can bypass the relative self. And, and so like, what I appreciate about psychology and the, and, the, and, the, and the conversation that's happening between psychology and Buddhism is psychologists, and like Ruth and, and like you two, what's your name? Mike. Mike, um, like emphasize the healthy self. And, and developing a healthy scaffolding. And I, I think it's really important um, to develop a healthy scaffolding. And sometimes that means, as a practitioner, that maybe all the answers aren't in Buddhist practice. Some of the answers may be found in your own personal history, working with a psychotherapist, digging into the particulars, and finding you know what's really going on there. Because it's possible, as a practitioner, I can say for sure, because I've certainly done this, <laughs> to leap over that and say, oh, that's, you know, that's the self. It's just like, you know, I'm going for anatta, you know. So then, 
And then, but that doesn't actually get rid of the, the problems. The problems then go into hiding because they know you don't like them. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. I, I, I like to think of, now I'm thinking, I don't know, I'm really curious about what you think about this yeah. Rinpoche. So I, I definitely have something to say about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I think I completely agree with you, and I think that is, in a way, issue of many practitioners that kind of bypassing. So Dharma, Dharma is, I mean, there's a particular story that uh, uh, one st student goes up to the mountain, uh, this meditate with the Tibetan Lama on meditation on compassion. So he's meditating in compassion and the Lama saying, have compassion to all the sentient beings. Every sentient being has been your mother, therefore they deserve compassion from you. And he just came from big, big fight with his mother. Yeah. <laughs> and he thinks his mother is an obstacle for his spiritual development. He doesn't allow us to go to retreats. So a big fight, now he's here with the Lama and thinking about the mother. <laughs> so I think that's a very typical situation that many, many people run away from life, family, businesses, work, where it challenges them, mm -hmm. and sitting in somewhere doing nothing is easy as long as they have enough money to last for some time, right? So I completely <laughs> agree that, that Buddhism should not become a bypass and people do need to work with that personality. And I think Buddhist teaching is to work with personality. Buddha awakening was recognition of suffering. The, that's the most important journey. And I think, so it's not, I would not say that Buddhism does not have the deep personal work. I would say more people, Buddhist practitioner, don't apply Buddhist practice, applying a deep personal work. And that's exactly what we are trying to do is three door is they are working with their deep stuff. They don't even share with their own husband and wife, but they share in the group and trying to figure out that with the practices, mm -hmm. giving spacious, luminous hug to everybody. So I think, uh, so I, think there's, uh, I agree completely, but I think it's, a f it's not fair to say in Buddhist, it's not there. Mm. Yeah. The other thing that strikes me about Mike's comment is, you know, we're just so limited by language because in the West, I mean, we talk about self and, and that's what we call it. And so even mm -hmm. when you, I almost think it's easier sometimes for people to think ultimate self when you start using divine and, you know, things bigger than yourself and other kinds of language so that we don't default to our own conceptual self, um, but you get into all sorts of trouble with that too. This is nice, and I want to take one more question, but I also want to just point out that even in this exchange, we brought another layer of this discussion here with the, the idea of a relative self and a relational self, and mm -hmm. the idea that that is located in, in a body and, 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 and how we move in the world and how we communicate. And we'll take one more question, Dave. Thanks, everyone. It's been really amazing to, to, to hear body. And as we move into speech and mind, I think there'll be a really nice um, coherence. And I look forward to that. Here's my question. Rinpoche, you talked yesterday a little bit about transformations and how some of the practices, the core practices that you teach require there to be obscurations in order to have a transformation. If you don't have obscurations, there is no, there's no way to have a transformation. So, Or at so least you have to think you have one. <laughs> 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 okay, the, the thinking is maybe enough. But, and that may be its own obscuration. <laughs> thinking. Um, so my, I guess my, my, my question, uh -huh. and, and sort of to, to you all to maybe for, for addressing and to comment on, is this idea of um, uh, uh, you dealing with this relative self of, of having, what is the necessary means of, 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 of transforming, of actually progressing as, to even, to even consider this absolute self or even trying to embody this absolute self without going through the necessary transformations that people need to go through in suffering with the relative self. So if you don't deal with those relative 
sufferings, why even consider going anywhere near the non-dual absolute self, right? So can you maybe comment on the, the, the necessities and maybe the, the, the benefits of suffering? <laughs> Please. Oh, the benefits of suffering. <laughs> <laughs> the necessities. Well, yeah, just because we're on the body part, I would say one beauty of suffering, like just taking our everyday sufferings, is they have a possibility to draw us into the body. And because really, where do we experience suffering? Where do we experience emotion? Where do we experience fear? Where do we experience anger? Where do we experience, it's, it's here. You know, it's here, it's not just here. Here's the ideas and the thoughts and they might trigger, but then it's really gonna be down here. So I love suffering. <laughs> I love suffering. I have a lot of it, by the way, um, because it draws me into the body, and, mm. and it allows me to befriend. Just exactly, I just loved, what, I loved Rinpoche's phrase, the warm, luminous, spacious hug. Where is that going to happen? It's going to happen in the nervous system, in the body, however you want to put it. And... And the body is teaching exactly, I think, the body itself is teaching just what Rinpoche just described. It's teaching us how to be spacious. It's teaching us how to be luminous. If we go deep enough into that, all the qualities of awareness are just present in the body. So, so, the, so the suffering is like a great mm -hmm. invitation, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I think... Uh, it's okay. <laughs> 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 so suffering, as Lama Villa says, absolutely it's a door. But I think the question is not very much if suffering is important or not. It's the, the how you handle the suffering, what your relationship is suffering. So sometimes you can have a technique which is worse than the suffering itself. <laughs> and you will call it technique also. And those kind of techniques will keep you very long, continuously suffering. Mm -hmm. But there are other techniques where, which is more, sh more I say, shorter way, if you are capable of. If not, you have to, you have to do what you have to do. But you have to look at your options, which might you fit in. And a very simple way I can define it in two ways, conceptualizing or non-conceptualizing. Mm -hmm. Or if you're somebody is suffering, if you're thinking about something you're suffering, I'll tell you, don't think about it. Why are you thinking about it? Well, it's easy to say, how good are you? Good, how good at, uh, you are at doing that? And some people can, maybe they're very much into their body, or they can say, okay. But for example, one time I remember in the, this movie where, the, uh, where this one alcoholic guy goes to the Lama, and the Lama says, uh, goes, oh, you know, my family having problem, his alcohol problem, and the Lama says, don't drink. Just be happy, good be with the family. And that was the advice. And he was, he was saying, like, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> and came out, right? And then the, the person, Western friend, who was with me, he said, what kind of advice is that? <laughs> <laughs> you know? And, uh, and I, I came out, and I did not, I thought it was a very normal advice, but she was very shocked by the advice. Then I realized, what, what's going on here? Okay, I get it. And uh, for for him, listener, was, it means so much. This person told me personally this advice. It means so much for me. For her, it was like, I don't know, anybody giving, telling, reading on a YouTube or something, just a few lines of advice. Doesn't help. For sure, it will not help her. But for him, that was it. it changes his life. My lama told me not to drink and be nice with the family. <laughs> <laughs> So I think it has something to do with it. It's not going through the suffering. How your relationship with the suffering, this is a change of relationship. I think this is what's really important. Okay? Mm. Yeah, you Oof. please, yes. Anything? Well, just the idea of obscurances being um, food for transformation. Mm. I'm just excited about how many opportunities I have to transform. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful way to end. So this is sort of going to conclude our discussion of the body in this, this morning session this morning. And the body is the kind of touchstone, right, um, for 
our discussions this afternoon around the breath and the mind. So I want to thank all the panelists, thank Ruth, you. for your presentation. Thank you. Mama Willa, Tenzin Wang Rinpoche. Thank you very much. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> and we'll see you this afternoon. Yes, and for those here,